right, it's official. We can start. Uh, what I'm going to do is um, spend a few minutes just to hit the highlights of the sample Hello World example. Then we'll go into another example that's a little more um, uh, meaningful and has a little more functionality to it. Our goal for the first two weeks of class, and again, we didn't have class, we only had class one day last week, so this extends in the next week as well, will be just to familiarize yourself with the environment and to go over some Java things that, that you may or may not um, be aware of just because, again, just because, uh, you know, your background, programming background, you may not have done Java and you may have done C Sharp, which is similar, but again, not, not identical. Also key with Java is understanding object-oriented concepts. So we will be stressing that quite a bit. One thing, uh, well, comparing this to that, that I think in this environment there is uh, a lot less code that gets generated for you. So you have to go in and there's some shells that are generated from you, but a lot of the other code isn't. All right, this is our welcome application. If you remember, it just popped open a screen that says, uh, welcome to Android development. Let's review the files that are involved. In fact, let me ask you to review those. What's in the Android manifest file? In the Android manifest file is information about the installation of the application. So it will include things such as what the activity is it should start, um, what uh, permissions are required, and so on. There's not a lot in this particular one. The three drawable folders are the different images, and they relate to different images for different screen densities. The idea is because on a high definition or high density device, um, the pixels are packed closer together. If you use the same image, it will actually look smaller on uh, a high density monitor. All right? And that's probably not a good, good thing. I keep saying monitor, I mean screen. All right? Uh, old, old habits die hard. All right. Um, therefore, you make them bigger. You, you, you make bigger images, more pixels, and that way, when they're more tightly compressed together, they'll be the same size. And this is this is something that we're going to see throughout this course in, in a variety of different contexts. And these little things at the end of the folder name, like in this case, the HDPI, are called resource qualifiers. And what they do is they specify when a particular resource is used. So this is our first encounter with that, that depending on the, on the density of the device, we'll use one image or another. And I think in this particular case, the only image that's different is the icon. But you can make all the images different if you wanted to. Probably would be a good idea, actually. The layout. We have our main XML, and it's an XML file that specifies the layout the different controls that are on the page, or the different views that are on the page. View is, is, a, is a better Android term than control. Our values are where we're going to put all of our hard-coded strings. Um, we're not going to hard-code them within the code themselves. We're going to put them in the strings XML file. And that is beneficial, number one, because it allows you to keep things consistent since it's defined in that file and not defined throughout the code, if you decide to change something, you only need to change it, the, the one instance of it in the file, as opposed to hunting down every instance of a string in, um, in, in all your code. The other advantage is, is, is as far as localization of this. Uh, later on, we'll see how we can use resource qualifiers to um, make different versions of this depending on the language setting of your device so that we can have a, um, a, a strings XML for French, for example.
lastly, we have our code files, which in the welcome case is very simple. Um, sort of the, 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 the boss that sort of runs the show here is going to be extended from activity. All right. And there will be an onCreate method at least, which sort of gets the ball rolling and does what it needs to do. This is kind of standard logic at the beginning, a standard line of code. And we're setting the content view. Essentially what we're doing is we're setting the, the display, the screen associated with this activity, which is finding in the R layout main. All right? In other words, in the resources folder under layout, the main XML is where it's finding it. All right. So we're going to build upon that and do a little bit more and do a little bit of Java review um, in our next example. So let me get rid of this one. You don't have to delete them like I'm doing when you're done. I just like to keep the workspace uncluttered so it's, it's easy for me to find what I'm looking for. Um, there's an option to delete the code or keep the code. So by me deleting it from my workspace, I'm not, uh, uh, or, or from within the clips, I'm not like deleting the, the source files. I'm just like removing it from here. So I don't, uh, you know, I'm not bothered by it. I don't um, see it. All right. Let me close out of everything. And then I'm going to import my example for today. So I go to File, Import, Existing Project in the Workspace. Again, this is what you do if you're starting a project uh, based on someone else's code. Code is already there. So when you download the examples, this is what you'll do. Um, or if you download my examples or the examples from the book, this is what you'll do to get them into Eclipse and to be able to run them. Um, if you are creating your own, of course, you'll go and you'll say instead to create a new uh, Android application and go through those steps. All right, next, I'm going to browse and find it. I believe this is the one in question. Actually, I'm going to use this one. finish. And there it is imported. And we'll look and again it has a consistent sort of directory structure as the other one. It has its manifest files, resources, the binaries that get compiled, any assets, any additional things that it uses, um, the Android development uh, framework, the some files that are generated, and then finally the source. Let's look at the Android manifest and see if there's any different than the other one. And it isn't really any different than the other one. Really nothing um, in here that's different. The only thing that is different is I define my own package all right, for this code where it lives. EDU Lorraine CCC uh, CISS 268, which is incorrect because this is not CISS 268. It's CISS 265. All right. Um, for Java packages, this is sort of the naming convention that's done. You sort of use a reverse URL. Um, the reason for that is to guarantee uniqueness. All right. As you can imagine, you know, you could be working on a class, for example. The, the, the classic example I give is, is if you were a furniture manufacturer and you were keeping track of your inventory. All right, and you had a class for tables, tables being three or four legged things that you put stuff on. All right, someone that works for Oracle working on databases might have a class for tables, tables being an entity in a database. Well, both classes are called tables. What if you happen to want to use both of them in the same application? All right. The packages allow you to qualify that and allow you to point to the different ones. So you can put your applications uh, or your classes in different uh, packages. Now, 
The question becomes, how do you guarantee that the package names are unique? Well, the one thing we know in this world that's unique is a URL, right? There is no one in this world other than Lorain County Community College that has a URL of lorainccc.edu, all right? So therefore, they use that sort of as the basis. So it's not like it's running out to that URL and finding anything. That name is just to guarantee uniqueness. So again, for most of my examples, I use EDU, Lorraine CCC, and maybe I tack something on the end of it. All right. The idea is, is if you're all working in the same organization, you'll coordinate things to make sure you don't have any interference within your organization. But if you're using classes from another organization, they'll have a different uh, reverse URL at the start of their name, and so you'll be okay. So that's the bit with the package name. The rest of this is the same. We've indicated, I've indicated the icon that's going to be used. The application name, again, I get from the string file. The app name I get also from the string file. The uh, intent of this action. When we fire up this, this activity, what, what we get, and so on down the line. Let's see. Minimum SDK version is of 7. All right. And I think that's about it. Again, these are all used when we are installing uh, this. Values. I have values for um, a variety of different strings. I also have value, uh, uh, I, have, I have a string array. Now we'll see how we're going to use that. I'm going to use that in the GUI to create a dropdown. All right? If you think of what is a dropdown, a dropdown is a list of values, an array, one dimensional array of string values. So this is my list of levels of service. I then again have a prompt. This is going to be a prompt on my screen, all right, that will ask the user for something. And again, this helps ensure consistency. So if I had another activity, or let's say, associated with this app that also asked for level of service, I would use this string. And if I decided to change it, change the wording of it or whatever, I would keep it consistent, all right? Likewise, this list is defined here to keep it consistent. The one thing I, I say in, in just about all my programming classes is just about any time if you, if you are asked the question, why do we do something that way, the answer is almost always for maintainability, right? So, you know, if I ask, well, why do we have a strings XML file? Just yell out maintainability and you'll be right. All right. uh, it is also good to know why it makes it more maintainable. And again, this allows it to be more consistent. You change it one place, you change it the other. And it has the added benefit of making it more maintainable if we're going to localize this. All right, and give different values for uh, different languages. The only drawables I have are the three icons. And again, different sizes. Following the same proportions I did last time, the medium being a certain size, a uh, high density being approximately 1.5 that size, and the lower density being, I think, three quarters of the medium density, something like that. All right. With icons, it's pretty much. Uh, uh, standard the sizes that you make them. So for example, this icon here pretty standard for a medium density icon to be 48 pixels. So a high density would be 72 and a low density would be 36. So that's pretty standard. There's a whole set of rules and guidelines for good icon development. Um, 
icons being simple, icons not containing words in them, um, icons ideally being transparent. All right, if you notice on a lot of a lot of devices, if you look at the icons, they're not square blocks um, like this one is. Instead, there there's an area that's transparent, so maybe it looks like a circle, or maybe it looks like whatever. So all those are prepared. There's there's a lot of great uh, Android resources that would describe this in in much greater detail. All right, our layout file. Look at the XML. All right. Now, this is a linear layout. All right. If you remember, the last example we had was a relative layout. And with a relative layout, you say how things are positioned relative to other things. I'm not going to pull it back up, but it said that this label was below this label and this image was below this label and so on down the line. With a linear layout, consider it as just a straight line that's either going horizontally or vertically. In this case, the orientation is vertically. So these elements, if we notice, are going to stack on the screen going down one after another. So with however many things that we have, looks like we have five of them, they'll be just down in a straight line, one, two, three, four, five, vertical. All right. We have a couple new views. We have a text view, which is not a new view. We had a text view in the other one. And think of that as being like a label. It's a read-only text. All right. What this is, and I probably should have introduced this to you first, is this is a simple tip calculator that um, asks the user for the amount of the um, of the um, of the meal, the level of service, and then based on the level of service, it does a calculation and, and um, says what the tip is. All right. In fact, let's run it to see what it does. This probably would have been a good idea from the start, all right? Here's what this does. Again, nothing elegant.
remember this is this is a, this is a, just the thing that says simple tip calculator on the very top of the page. In fact, pass this around. Take a look. This is the word simple tip calculator on the top of it. Why doesn't that text view need an ID? Any guesses? Well, I'm, oh, go ahead. Because I'm not doing anything with it, exactly. I'm not changing it, all right? I am setting it based on a string file. And again, if I internationalize this, it will use the, the proper string file. But it's not like I'm coding to do anything. I'm not grabbing the value of it and doing a calculation or, or anything like that. So I don't need really an ID because the IDs are used to point to things. Now, these, these guys, the text for the amount of the, of the, uh, the, the bill, the text for the spinner that allows you to select the type of service, the, the, the button, and the label with the results, all those I'm going to do something with. I'm going to program. All right? So therefore, I need to be able to point to them to say certain things. All right? That, yeah, this is the amount. I'm going to do something. So again, I have an ID. So I, as I create this object, this element, I create an ID called amount. And then I can use that ID of amount to point to this text box. All right? I specify the width of this. Notice that um, that there's for, for both the width and the height, there's there's a few things I use. One is fill parent. Fill parent means make it as big as the parent space. Make it as make it fill the, the parent space. So in this case, the parent is that linear layout. So to fill the parent means to go all the way across. So for here, where I say fill parent for that spinner control, that's why that drop down goes all the way across, because I said fill parent. The whole view takes up all that space. If I make that fill the parent, it makes it that big. Your other options, one of them is to wrap content. And wrap content simply means make it as big as it needs to be. Let's look at the button. The button I specify a width of rack content. So that button is big enough to fill, fill the, fit the words calculate tip. All right. If I were to uh, change the wording of it and say calculate tip for dinner or something like that, if I were to add more words to it, then that button would get bigger. Because whatever the content of it is, well, if you say rack content, it's going to make it the size to match the content. The other uh, thing that we do in here, we do a, a width of DP. And if you recall last time, DP stands for de uh, Density Independent Pixels, which means essentially pixels that get adjusted based on the density of the screen. So, for example, if I say this is... 100 dp, the medium density is considered the baseline. So 100 dp is uh, equal to, on a medium density display, is equal to 100 pixels. So it's a one to one. That's a great trick question that I might ask on some test someday. All right? If I have a, you know, how many, what's the difference between 100 pixels and 100 dp? if you're talking about a medium density display? And the answer is there is no difference, all right? Medium is considered the baseline, all right? So therefore, wherever DP it is, it'll be that many pixels. So on a medium density, if I define the width as 100 DP, it'll be 100 pixels wide. On a high density, it will be 150 pixels wide, all right? Because again, 100, you know, the the pixels are, are packed closer together. So if I made it 100 pixel on a high density, it would actually end up being smaller on a high density. And we don't want that. We want it to, to be a consistent size. So 100 dp on a high, de uh, high density uh, display will kind of come out to be 
um, 150 pixels. Finally, on a low density, um, the um, where the where the pixels are not so densely packed, where there's 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 more space in the pixels, you would need it to be less pixels because otherwise it would take be bigger than we want it to be. Um, so it will actually in this case end up to be 75 pixels. Now the good news is is well. I won't say it's the good news, because you should know that. You should know the reasoning behind it, all right? And you should know how to convert between physical pixels and, and, and uh, uh, density-independent pixels. But sort of the rule of thumb, all right, is always declare things in DP as opposed to pixels, all right? Because if you don't, if you declare them using pixels, then you're going to get the issue of an inconsistent sizing depending on the density of the screen. All right. Other things about this. This second view on here is an edit text view. All right. So where we enter the amount in, that is an edit text as opposed to a text view. We can specify that it can only accept a number. All right? So that way, if you notice, when this text box has focus, the rest of the keyboard is disabled. Only the numbers can I enter in. So that's a neat feature of that. All right? Um, in, in other languages, well, especially if you're doing web work, you know, you can't really control what's in a text box. A text box is a text box, right? And you have to validate it to control it. Whereas here you can specify the allowable things that, that can be put into this edit text. And in this case, we say it's a number. The request focus means when this activity starts, the focus will come to this. All right. That way, you know, the focus is automatically put in there. The person doesn't have to tap on the text box to, to, to enter in it. Okay. The next control that we have that's different is a spinner. All right. The spinner is the drop-down control. Where you click it. Where you click on it and you have a list of options. It would be in what other languages it's called a drop down. Can we have an ID associated with it? Because we're going to need that in doing our calculation. We want to fill parent, which it went all the way across, wrap content. Now, the entries from that, uh, from that uh, for the spinner, comes from an array called levels of service. All right. So, if you remember, in our strings folder, or I'm sorry, strings XML file, we had strings and string arrays. Because this is a list of options for this particular spinner, we're not specifying a single value, we're specifying a list of values. Therefore, we don't have at string, we have at array. And that will give us a list of all those values. Finally, we have a prompt, which is what appears on the top of the spinner when the spinner is activated. We have a button that has text associated with it and an ID. And then finally, we have where we're going to put our answer which is the actual tip. All right, let's now look at the code. 